Hey, Skeeters fans, Ryan Posner here, and on today's episode of Down in Sugar Land, my co-host Brandon and I will react to the Astros' opening series against the A's. We'll break down the Astros' alternate site squad and an interview with Skeeters manager Mickey Story, and we'll finish the episode off with a little bit of the happy hour. Hit the music, Troy. Looking to relocate? Then contact Nick DeRose for any of your real estate needs in the Dallas Metroplex area. For more information, give them a call at 469-283-8360. DeRose Dallas Realty. Cowboy by nature. Agent by trade. All right, Brandon. Well, opening week has come and gone. And if you're an Astros fan and an Astros observer, I don't think that first series could have gone much better against the Oakland days. A four-game sweep, you outscore them 35-9. to nine. I mean, that is just an absolute crushing of the Oakland A's who won the ALS last year. I mean, yeah, that 35 to nine was actually the worst run differential in a four game series since the Philadelphia A's were outscored 39 to 11 in a four game series against the Indians in 1950. So it just goes to show how boy did the bats come alive. And not only that, knocking out of the park in a stadium, you and I mentioned this over the weekend when we were watching the game, that's not really like a baseball park. And especially hitting at night in Oakland, for those that haven't been there, it's not easy to do. No, that park is kind of already playing as a a hitter's park, or a pitcher's park, rather. But then when you put it at night, it's a total pitcher's advantage. And you wouldn't have known it looking at the scores of the Astros. I mean, 8-1, 9-5, 9-1. Then they had the day game where they went 9-2. I mean, just everybody, really just the contributions were not, you know, singular to a certain group of guys. I mean... You have Chaz McCormick getting his first start yesterday. He went yard, and I loved the quote after the game. And they only actually made Chaz McCormick available. He was the only guy to speak to the media after the game. And his quote, we just crushed them. Like, (laughs) I don't think he could have said it any better. I mean, Kyle Tucker homered, Jason Castro homered. I mean, you saw Alex Bregman homered in two straight games. The only really, you know, thing you look at this weekend and you're kind of concerned about is Michael Brantley, but it looks like he's going to be okay and he'll be back in the lineup this week. Yeah, the x-ray was negative just day-to-day at this point, so that's a that's a huge relief because he's leading the teams in du- in the team in doubles right now with four, and you mentioned it, everybody doing the job. I mean, the guy that's leading the team in RBIs right now is Tucker with seven, and then you look at how I know uh, your boy Kaplan hates lineup construction, but when we were talking about Altuve being the leadoff hitter, the one thing I always look for the leadoff guy is how many runs are you scoring? Leading the team right now with eight runs. So it's good to see that he's getting on base and coming around to score. And it's it's showing right now. Right now, these bats are red hot. And I, I love it. I think a bunch of fans right now are looking around the league and seeing that this is a scary team. Yeah, and I feel like maybe and maybe it's just me, but I you know, people might have forgotten if you're not an Astros fan that this guy named Jordan Alvarez also plays for them. Yeah. I mean, he missed pretty much all of last season after winning the rookie of the year. And I mean, that guy, he puts the easiest swing on a ball. And I mean, he hits it opposite field. It just looks like he's barely touching. It goes like 400 plus feet. And then one thing that you think about is like, what was the down spot was probably Maldonado who had six strikeouts and right now leading the team. But then you plug in Castro, the Astro, he comes back and goes yard as well. So I mean, it's a situation where they had a, a weakness right there. Replaced it with Castro, and then he shows that he can fit right in in that lineup. Castro the Astro. I like that one. I'm sure that ha- that he's been an Astro, the longest tenured guy on the team. I mean, I know he's been two different stints, but uh, also, I mean, with Maldonado, too. I mean, hey, look at the pitching lines. I mean, one run in the game, first game, five with McCullers start, but still McCullers looked incredibly sharp in his in his outing. Um, I mean, every all the way around, I mean, I, I'll, I'll take Maldonado the way he's, you know, he's sitting like a frog back there and calling, putting on the signs, he's doing a good job so far. And, you know, leading into that, the, the pitching staff, I mean, my goodness, as, as good as you could possibly hope for too, especially yesterday, Brandon Belak, a guy who I kind of maybe pegged as the guy that might have been the opening day starter for the Skeeters, throwing, you know, a perfect three-plus innings of relief yesterday to uh, keep the bullpen nice and rested. Four and two-thirds. And then yeah. he went hitless. And I mean, not even giving up a hit, not a run, anything like that. Four strikeouts, no walks. He's the reason Dusty actually alluded to it in the press game conference. They're going in this two-game set against the Angels, and because Belak was able to go for so long, they're going to have a rested pen to where they can just throw guys out there if need be, if the starters aren't going the distance. But even the starters were pretty lights out. Grinky, six innings pitched, four strikeouts, only giving up three hits, no walks, no runs, getting the win. I mean, everybody kind of did their job minus, 
Javier and Euricity. They're, they're, they're the only down spot. Yeah, I misspoke on that. That was Javier who got the Friday night start, which was the closest game. I mean, 9-5. That was <laughs> making you sweat a little bit there with the four runs. I mean, he was almost getting you in a safe situation. <laughs> yeah, Javier, he did go three and two-third inning pitch, four strikeouts, giving up three hits. He didn't walk anybody, but a 4.91 ERA for your first start. Not that great. You kind of expect a little bit more innings out of him. He and Anoli were probably the only downside. Anoli Paredes were probably the only downside in the pitching. Paredes, I mean, I think it was in two games. He uh, had, yeah, two games in an inning and a third walked four guys. Not what you really want in an inning third from your middle relief. Only down spots. Otherwise, everybody else, they did their job and looked, looked pretty solid. Yeah, and they'll get some boost to that bullpen there. Uh, Pedro Baez, who was one of their big acquisitions, uh, he got COVID uh, in spring training. He's yet to get back on the mound, so that'll be a nice addition, a former Dodger uh, reliever. Also, Andre Scrub, another guy they'll get back at some point. So the bullpen's going to definitely get some people, you know, as the season goes on, guys that have contributed in big ways at the Major League roster. But, I mean, the Brandon Belak story, that's great. And Luis Garcia getting a start this week. I mean, those are both guys I, I definitely, you know, kind of just pegged as, like I said, guys that might be in struggling, but they're already making big contributions at the major league level um i mean and now you, you know got the, you got angels this week it's going to be a big series for them and they go right back to oakland hosting them here so you have a really you have a chance to really put the former division champions kind of in a, in a tough spot at least i know it's a long season but at least just the uh the visual of like hey we've absolutely dog walked the former division winner to start the year that's a, that's a nice little nice little sign well you mentioned it now that we're facing the angels for a two-game set they look pretty good too. Coming in at three and one. I mean, right now Astros sitting four and zero, right behind them. Angels three and one, and they took on a solid Chicago White Sox team that a lot of people are pegging to win the AL Central. And it's going to be an interesting matchup because you mentioned it: Luis Garcia going Monday night versus Jose Quintana, and then on Tuesday it's going to be Granky versus uh, Griffin Canning. So if they can pull off two wins right here, going up five nothing in the division, having at least a three game lead, yeah, super super early, but a red hot start allows you a lot of confidence heading into the later end of the dog days of summer. Yeah, I mean, and something else, too, that I think uh, Dusty Baker might have pointed out, or it might have been even the players themselves, was that, you know, this was the first series in front of fans for a lot of these guys, especially young guys like Anoli Paredes, Christian Javier. They've never really played in front of fans, and especially in a hostile environment, obviously the A's fans, they were they were plenty happy to boo the Astros as they came on and off the field. I know Correa got hit by a pitch, and didn't seem to be a lot of uh, teary-eyed fans there about that, and they were – Oh, so clever with the uh, lineup music, but it seems like everyone, you know, held it pretty well. And it helps when you got your veterans like Bregman coming up and hitting monster home runs. That'll quiet the crowd in a hurry. Well, I think the Astros kind of broke the spirit of the Oakland fan base because on opening night, there was 10,000 in the crowd, which is right now, it, it looks like a packed house with 10K just in that sure. stadium. But yeah. And then the last game of the series, 4,800 on Easter Sunday. So... I think they just didn't want to go out there no. and see what was continuing on as a just a beating going down. But this red hot start, man, this is something where you know a lot of teams where now that fans are back in the park, we're kind of gunning for us. They feel like we escaped 2020 with no fans in the ballpark to heckle us. And I think this is a great way to just show everybody that uh, we're we're not going to be scared of any of your taunting coming at us, putting up monster numbers quickly. Yeah, that's the easiest way I think to uh, silence a lot of the. Uh, the quote unquote haters around around the game, especially when you go intra division like that, there's going to be people who are just chomping at the bit, uh, ready to boo you. Well, I mean, I don't know, Brandon. I feel like out of all the teams in the major leagues, if you're going to power rank the stars, I, I, you know, I know we're an Astros podcast, but I, I don't think you can put a team above the Astros the way they started. That's an historic start, not even just in Astros history, kind of in baseball history. I think if you ask league ground uh, everybody around the league who's kind of top dog opening series. I think it's obvious right now. It's definitely us. Yeah, I mean the the Yankees, another team that was supposed to, you know, their their power rank. They actually lost two of three to uh, to the Toronto Blue Jays, Dodgers. They took uh, two of three from the Rockies. So I mean, there there are some of those teams that are up there. I mean, none of them, and they, I mean, record aside, just none of them did it in as such dominant fashion. Red Sox got swept by the Orioles. I mean, yeah. it's a situation where, again, you're, you're mentioning it super super early, but this is the kind of start that you kind of dream up. Yeah, it's a long season, and I think. Uh, people or even around the country who were, you know, just oh so hoping for the Astros to really just fall on their face are kind of getting a glimpse like, oh man, like that core they had, I mean, minus George Springer is so so intact. 
you've got a veteran pitcher. By the way, did you see those uh, pictures of Zach Grinky like sitting crisscross like he's doing yoga during the games? I, he's he's a midseason form of that. I mean, he's just centering his chi, and it, it shows six <laughs> innings right there of no ERA. So that's that's a solid start. <laughs> like you think Dusty Baker's just sitting there, you know, he's chewing on his toothpick, and you know, he's just he's, and he's like. What is, what is he doing? No. <laughs> Dusty just looks at him and says, I only know one Yogi. And yeah. That's about it while he chews on another two right. <laughs> I love it. That was so Zach Grinky right there to see the beginning of the year. Well, you got, you got anything more here, Brandon? No, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for opening day, get some fans in this ballpark, and just put on a bigger show. Right now, we got to take these next two against the Angels. That's, that's a huge step right here. We can really set ourselves apart quickly. Absolutely. A lot of more division games coming up this week. And when we come back on Down in Sugar Land, me and Brandon are going to run through the Astros alternate site squad, kind of get an idea of who might be out here in Sugar Land come May. You're listening to Down in Sugar Land. Baseball is back at Constellation Field, and full-season ticket deposits are now available. May 20th is just around the corner, and you won't want to miss exciting baseball this summer as the Skeeters enter their first season as the AAA affiliate of the Houston Astros. For more information, visit SugarlandSkeeters.com and be one of the first to reserve a seat. All right, so one of the developments here with the Astros roster now that they've announced their opening day roster is they also announced their alternate site roster. And Brandon, this kind of really pertains to us here down in Sugarland, no pun intended, because these are some of the guys that we're probably going to see here uh, with the Skeeters to start. I mean, these are guys that they found it pertinent to get work in at their alternate site in Corpus Christi before they open the season here in the minor leagues. And, uh, you know, there's some interesting names here. Um, I don't know about any really big surprises. What are, what are some of your general thoughts here about the names you're seeing here on this on this roster? It's a bunch of guys that are right there on the cusp of making the team. So if there's any injuries, I think they can not only step in, but also produce as well. One guy that jumped out to me, Garrett Stubbs. He seems to always be winning awards. I mean, he, he played at USC. He actually won the 2015 Johnny Bench Award, which is the nation's best catcher award. And then 2016, he was a California League mid-season uh, All-Star. 2017, Texas League All-Star. In 2018, he was a PCL All-Star. I mean, and even in that 2017 season, he was named best defensive catcher in the league by Baseball America. So you can see he's collecting all these type of awards. Clearly, he's got a glove. He's an All-Star. I think he's just a superstar winning to break out. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy, I think every organization, they, they want a Garrett Stubbs. I mean, he's a guy, he's your third catcher, I guess, on the depth chart, but... The guy caught a, a inning in the ALCS last year. I mean, he's got he's the guy that they trusted that much to put in a winner go home game in the you know the the last game of your season. Um, I think if you peel the curtain back here a little bit even more, Brandon, you kind of you see that the Astros were able to carry a five man taxi squad on the road when they went to Oakland as well as now into Anaheim. And those guys, Ralph Garza Jr., right handed reliever, and Navarro Rodriguez pitched a little bit last year with the Astros. Peter Solomon, a very intriguing guy, uh, former Notre Dame pitcher who's coming off Tommy John. Garrett Stubbs, like you mentioned, then Abraham Toro. So I think, you know, you, you look at those guys and clearly they're going to be, those are the five guys that, you know, they're looking at, hey, okay, obviously you need some relievers, give you some depth. Um, Ralph Gard is a junior, kind of one of those guys who's been around for a while, hoping to make his debut this year. But yeah, they see Stubbs and you see Toro, who just missed out on the roster and he was actually dealing with a little bit of COVID stuff there right at the end of spring training. But we're kind of getting that clearer picture here of what we might see down here in Sugarland. Yeah, Toro is somebody that we've talked on several podcast occasions about he and Robel Garcia really battling for that final spot. So we you know, we mentioned it earlier, you're probably going to see those guys intertwine. Whoever's swinging the hot bat will probably on the roster. If not, we'll be down here in Sugarland, so be nice to have him. I like how we keep dropping that too, it just is. to reinforce. I know, right? <laughs> it almost seems like we set it up as a bit. We actually have to say it every five <laughs> seconds, and then just we're gonna put it in your head like that. This is the podcast. But uh, you know, another kind of cool area of note here is the outfield. I think that's one of the areas for the Astros, and the, the depths already being tested here. Michael Brantley going down with the a forearm injury, a wrist injury, which we're hoping is minor. But the the four outfielders they have on the taxi squad: Ronnie Dawson, Brian De La Cruz, Jake Myers, and Jose Siri. Uh, Ronnie Dawson, a guy who's been there for a while, went to the Ohio State University. Great power, speed, threat. Uh, Brian De La Cruz, he's actually on the injured list right now. He's dealing with a leg laceration is what they're calling it. Um, another guy who um, he's right there on the doorstep. And another interesting prospect, though, a guy who was a you know at one point considered one of the top players in the Reds' farm system, and that's Jose Siri. I wonder what he might be able to do there. At, at major, maybe at the major league level this year. Yeah, Siri, you, you mentioned it. He was signed as a 17-year-old by the Reds, spent seven years in their organization, bounced around by a bunch of people, made his way to the Dominican Leagues, then finally picked up by the Astros. But 
25 years old, and he's got a lot of tools. You're going to hear that about him constantly. Hits for power, speed, got a great glove, good arm. He's somebody that could probably fill a roster spot right now if we, you know, if injuries start to plague us by any means and produce really well. You know, I, I kind of mentioned that to start this segment of the guys that are going to fill in on roster spaces here are not just bottom of the order type of hitters or players. They they can really play. Yeah, and that outfield depth kind of thinned out a little bit. They released Steven Souza. So, you know, you look at a guy like Jose Siri, he might him and Brian De La Cruz, I mean, I'm just opining here. I think those are the two guys that might be the, you know, next up, you know, if the Astros need an outfielder. And then we go to the infield. I don't think there's too many surprises. Alex DeGody, we we've already sung his praises here on the podcast. Uh, former Lightning Sloth, CJ Hinojosa on there. Taylor Jones, a guy who got a, a cup of coffee last year. Um, another an interesting name. I know Astros fans are chomping at the bit to see this guy in the big leagues, and that's Jeremy Pena. Um, Jake Kaplan last week was saying, you know, he might he might just be the heir apparent to Carlos Correa. And obviously, Brandon, there was there were some discussions this week about Correa and his contract extension, and uh, he was he was pretty vocal and pretty open about you know what he was hoping for and what he's seen so far in terms of contract extensions. Yeah, it was almost kind of a slap in the face that he took it for what they offered to him six years 125 and then they came back or six years 120 and then they came back with a five-year 125 and this is days after you just saw uh lindor sign a massive contract 341 million over 10 years uh tatis jr as well over in san diego 14 340 million dollar deal and then you're coming at correa who's right in that echelon with those guys and in fact has hardware to go back also with his statistics and you're coming in right around the 120s I, I'd understand why he's so upset yeah we'll, we'll see where that goes I mean he did himself confirm those numbers which you tend to not see players or organizations I guess the Astros didn't confirm it but having the player confirm it um not a not a huge not a, something you see I guess very often but we'll see how that goes I mean players don't like to negotiate during the season so we probably want to, well this kind of be a, t- a discussion tabled I guess you could say until the end of the regular season, but Jeremy Pena's uh, progression is something you're gonna have to keep your eye on because that could that could definitely force a decision one way or the other. And uh, you're definitely, I mean, he's gonna be in Sugar Land. I mean, for sure, at some point this year, it seems like Pena is a big kid. We've mentioned that before. He he's just gigantic in stature. Out of University of Maine, somebody that uh, wasn't highly touted in terms of being a top prospect. And out of Maine, he was dominated up there. Made his way down into the Dominican leagues where he was again and just a standout player so when you see him come over here he's going to be somebody that will be a uh, absolute monster and I think a lot of people are starting to notice him quickly sure yeah he's definitely starting to kind of catch that national uh, flame here he's not a top 100 prospect for most of the sites but I think if he gets off to a good start this year that's going to change in a hurry um, and you go to the pitching staff here again nothing too crazy I think one of the names you're kind of surprised to see is Jake Odorizzi but not you have to Put that in context as he's, he's just getting ready to ramp up and he should be ready to go here in the next couple series. Yeah, that's more of just a rehab stint for him to go into this sense just to kind of get the feel back. He he mentioned that he was on the Houston Astros podcast and he, he alluded to the fact that he was going to start out in the minors and it was literally just to kind of get the feel of the game and then he was going to probably make a comeback up here pretty soon. So that will be a huge addition to a starting oh, yeah. half that's already dominating quickly guy who was an all-star in 2019 i mean yeah just picture him in the astros rotation as as good as they were the first go through we got you know they got they got luis garcia coming on and but i mean that that is a huge addition to throw in there a couple guys i'm interested to see and i think they've caught kind of helium in the astros organization one of them is peter solomon um a guy went to notre dame had posted great numbers and had a tommy john uh missed all of 2019 and pretty much all 2020 as well but the with the shortened or the cancellation of the minor league season and the shortened major league season you know, they put him on the 40-man roster to protect him from the Rule 5 draft. So that in itself kind of shows you where the organization thinks of him and how highly they think of him. And then, hey, they put him on that travel squad, too. So Peter Solomon, a guy who could be here in Sugar Land, but um, a starter, veteran guy, you know, considering he's 24 years old. He's not he's not super, super young. I think a guy you could slot right in there. Um, a couple other names, Brett Conine, another guy, the Astros, I think pretty highly of, Tyler Ivey. Um, those, are, those are some guys. And uh, Johanze Torres, I think he's a little bit, farther back in terms of progression but the dude can just sling it he's an upper 90s guy uh, he'll be fun to watch and then at the bottom uh Hector Velasquez kind of a mystery guy because they signed him late in the last season but plenty of major league experience and maybe maybe that kind of that first left you have to go to out of there to the bullpen yeah it's interesting Velasquez 32 years old and, and you alluded to it played for the Red Sox he has an 11 and 7 uh, overall record with a 3.9 ERA high strikeout guy but at 32 years old, it's, you're starting to push into that age range where 
you better be effective quickly. Otherwise, I don't know how long you can actually last. But Velasquez has the kind of stuff and the leadership to where he could really have a dynamite season and play a pivotal role. Yeah, and he's left-handed, which definitely helps in terms of maybe, hey, we, we're facing a team that's got a lot of lefties coming up. Maybe we're going to bring you up for this series. Um, always a guy like a guy, a veteran guy like that to have in your back pocket, I'm sure, is going to be useful at some point. And uh, kind of interesting, too, I didn't I didn't know that teams were going to do this, and I, I found out that it's pretty common. Their Astros are going to play some games with their alternate side squad. Uh, they play on April 12th and 13th against the Round Rock, Round Rock Express. So that's going to be at Water, Whataburger Field in Corpus. Uh, then they have a couple games around Rock, and then actually on from May second to May third, uh, depending on how everything's going down here in Sugarland, and here we go again, uh, they might actually play these games at Constellation Field. So we might have a kind of our first glimpse at the Skeeters and you know the Round Rock Express before they, they, we start our season in Albuquerque. But very cool that we'll have some you know game action to maybe break down here in the uh, late part of April, early May. Yeah, they're essentially not having the games here to start because they're letting the field settle and everything. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So. I, I'm sure if everybody checked the media post, our field is not blue. I, everybody, a <laughs> I know, lot right? of people bet on that one on April Fools. They were all tweeting it, just <laughs> like, and people actually loved it. Are you kidding me? Get out of here! Like, I understand it goes with our colors, but a blue no field, no way, yeah, that would just hurt your eyeballs watching on TV, right? I, I mean, it's just one of those things. I mean, the baseball would show up quite nicely bouncing around on that I field, guess. but there's no way players could you imagine the astros hey we're so happy to be here by the way we made the field blue yeah no way i mean and obviously we have real grass out here so i don't know even how that works like you have to spray paint the grass i mean most fields that are blue it's it's field turf so yeah. we, we don't have field turf so i don't even know how that would work but most fields how many do you know of besides boise state eastern washington and I it's red and central arkansas well i'm just talking about like in terms of like full color not that not green grass I mean, good lord! You're not, you're, not, you're not even impressed that I rattled I said, off those two. I rattled off two like dude, off the cuff. No I'm impressed, Ryan. I'm impressed. <laughs> you gave me red fields over blue. Yeah, and then you, I said, "How many blue fields do you know?" And you named two red ones, and you're like, "Are you impressed?" Well, technically, <laughs> Arkansas. Right, never mind. I'm, Ar I'm on with Brandon on this one. <laughs> Central Arkansas is, is great, so that's it's not that's not red. <laughs> you're like a dog. I think you're colorblind. You're uh, just guessing. <laughs> well, either way, our field's green, so that's cool. And uh, that green field will be here May second and May third. We're hoping, fingers crossed, that we'll. Uh, be able to host those games and not sure if we'll open up the fans but either way we'll make sure we discuss them here on down in circle land when we come back an interview with mickey story the manager joining the podcast for the first time certainly won't be the last it's a great interview looking forward to it listening to you down in circle land hey skaters fans every Estonian knows that cherry king backyard store is the first and only stop for when you upgrade your backyard with the largest selection of outdoor furniture anywhere you're sure to find the right look for your new backyard oasis the finest quality merchandise at the lowest possible price every day that's the cherry king difference cherry king backyard store is proud to be the official outdoor furniture retailer of the sugarland skeeters visit one of the eight greater showrooms today all right welcome back to down in sugarland for the first time we welcome skaters manager mickey story to the show how's it going mickey really appreciate you taking the time man good good to be on yeah i mean we just want to get an idea you know you're you're on corpus right now what's uh what's a day in the life of mickey story right now what are you what are you doing there, down there at the alternate side to begin the year uh you know the on, on my end you know as as a manager of the alternate site and kind of running the whole program down here it's just scheduling, making sure we're following protocols with uh, the guidelines set out by MLB and and getting our work in on a daily basis the best we can with, with the parameters we have. So, you know, everything's mostly based around pitching. Um, you know, we got we got guys who need to throw every day. And if we can get a simulated game in that day, then then our hitters get some some uh, some live ABs. But other than that, you know, just just your normal day of of work. Uh, you know, hitting in the cage, taking ground balls, outfielders taking fly balls, and you know, just trying to trying to get some team fundamentals accomplished. Just because when the season kicks off, I like these guys to be prepared the best they can. So um, we're getting in good work, that's for sure. Right on. Well, I, I know Astros fans are, are pumped to have the AAA affiliate so close to home, but you know, as the manager and you're, you're a guy on the front lines of player development, how much does the, does the new affiliation between the Astros and the Skeeters boost you know the player development process as a, as a whole? Oh, it's huge because, you know, you can have your your people who are in Houston, you know, with the big league team right down the street and they can kind of bounce back and forth and just communication and, and linking up, you know, any which way we can um, is just, you know, way easier. You know, there's not that that distance of multiple hours or in some people's cases, flights even. So it's it's extremely easy to to communicate and and 
be in one place, you know, in the afternoon and be in the next place at night, you know, so we could have guys be at, almost, you know, at both games at the same time if you had access enough. So it's it's extremely accommodating to be this close to the big league team. Awesome. Yeah, I, I've done a little bit of research and I see that you're uh, you're kind of a big sneakerhead. I wanted to know, when did you uh, kind of develop <laughs> that love to collect shoes? And have you bought any pairs uh, recently you're super pumped up, up about? And also, oh, before you before you go cool. to, uh, I got to know, man, you got to help me point me in the right direction because my, my uh, kick gang can use a little bit of work. Yeah, once I get down to Sugarland, me and you will we'll, we'll get on the internet. I, I would have said we'll go to the mall, but I don't <laughs> think we'll be able to do that. But um, we'll get on the internet and look up some. Maybe we'll start off with Skeeter Colors and, and get you in the right direction. But, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, that's funny. It's funny. You definitely did some research to hear that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's something I, something I took took a liking to in, like, elementary and middle school, like a little bit back in the, the heyday of Michael Jordan and, you know, kind of just – evolved over years and in high school is just really really into it um kind of started getting into the world of the exclusive stuff and like waiting in lines and you know i got kind of a an addictive personality like if like i buy my son baseball cards occasionally and then i'm like okay i need to buy more like i need to buy more <laughs> and then before i know it i'm more into it than he is but that's kind of how sneakers had been for me for years and years and you know when i got to make a little bit more money um it just opened the floodgates for buying a lot of shoes. But I'll tell you what, these days I have really, really scaled back. My wife actually gave me credit this year for not taking so many shoes out to the <laughs> season. Normally I would take like multiple duffel bags this year. I, I left with four pairs. So oh, I love it. I, Mickey, what would you say? I'm getting is, old. Mickey, what would you say is your uh, prize pair of shoes that you own right now? Oh man, that's a tough one. I mean, we're talking like, this is no exaggeration. We're talking over, over 200, close to 300 pairs wow. of shoes total in my collection so like to pick one is just like you're really putting it on me but i mean i have some stuff that's pretty expensive that's exclusive but they probably wouldn't be my favorite to be a real sneaker nostalgic like i'm gonna have to go with like my my original pair of jordan 11s from like 2001 when i was in high school um and they're still in really really good condition they're jordan 11s the black and red they call nowadays they call them the bread 11, but it's, it's literally released probably 10 times since then. But that was like the second release ever of those. Like they released back in 96 when he wore them and then they came back out in 2001. But I still have that shoot to this day and it's like crazy good condition, <laughs> which is rare for, but it's just going to show you how good quality they made them back then. It was really good. It's, it's changed a bit. Yeah, that's but, awesome. My my uh, collection consists of like four pairs of shoes, so you have to you have to coach me up a bit <laughs> when you get out here. Um, and yeah, when, yeah. <laughs> before you even you know got to the minors, I saw you had a you know pretty prolific college career at Florida Atlantic. You know you're still top ten in a several you know pretty important categories as a pitcher. You know as a South Florida guy, how how proud were you to have such a great career down there, so close to home? And then also, what are the Mickey Story statue plans right now at the FAU uh, baseball stadium looking like? Yeah, you know what? I can't believe they don't have one up already. I've been waiting <laughs> for years. At, at one point, I was on a banner, and then I think they like either the windscreen banner got knocked down, <laughs> or they just got tired of it. Because I went back recently and it wasn't there, and I was kind of like, "Yo, what's going on here?" But the statue, <laughs> like, I've been asking for years, and I don't think it's going to get done. But I mean, being being a South Floridian, going to going to school at FAU, which was extremely close to where I grew up. Um, literally one at two exits away from my high school, you know, on 95 North, but it, it was, it was great. It, it gave that extra opportunity for my family to hang on and watch, watch me play a bit longer, um, before I got to pro ball where it became extremely hard for them to travel and, and, you know, go through the minor league grind of being in Midland, Texas or, you know, Sacramento, California or, or wherever I played, which is a lot of places, but. You know, it gave them, you know, a couple more years to see me play. Um, and I treasure it. Uh, it was a great decision. I got to go to college with, with some friends that I grew up with, some locals, played summer ball with some of these guys in high school and then ended up at FAU. So it was a great experience. Uh, I loved every bit of it. The head coach here, Kevin Cooney, was phenomenal. Um, he's since retired, but he treated me like a son. Um, still have a great relationship to this day. But um, met my wife at FAU. Uh, yeah, I can't say enough good things, but other than the statue not being up yet, but you know, it's, <laughs> it, it kind of helped mold me who I am today. Um, spending that time at FAU, oh, nice. um, and, and, and the categories, you know, 
like it was great, you know, but I, you know, the, the memories is what I, 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 I treasure the most, like having a good career there and, and actually it kind of ended pretty poorly cause I got hurt, but, um, the memories that were built over that time and the friendships were, were what's really important. That's good stuff right there. And yeah, man, we'll get, we'll get our audience here. We'll start the campaign, grassroots it, GoFundMe as well. We'll get that statue up here in no time. Absolutely. Please, <laughs> please talk talk to somebody. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I saw your, your your playing career took you to a bunch of different countries, cities, you know, the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, and Mexico, but it also took you here to Sugarland at one point while yeah. you were with the Somerset oh, yeah. Patriots. What do you remember about that? Yeah. Oh, man, I remember it being the best, uh, you know, after playing so long in, in AAA and in the big leagues, and then playing in the Atlantic League, um, coming to Sugarland was like a little bit of a reminder of like the PCL and like good AAA affiliates because it was such a nice ballpark, um, and it had a good it had good crowds. Not that the other ones weren't, but you know the, the Northeast can get old, like some of the ballparks. But Sugarland had a nice ballpark. It had a great team hotel, um, right there, the Courtyard Marriott mm-hmm. that I remember in a good area with a bunch of good restaurants. So it, it was like that little refresher of, I remember we did like seven day road trips too to Sugarland, yep. <laughs> something crazy like that, like a full week and you just played them seven times, but it was okay because Sugarland was the best setup in the league. So nobody minded, but I remember it being a really, really nice, right. Like nice affiliate and great area. I remember after playing in Houston for, for a couple of years and knowing about Sugarland, but not spending much time there. Um, thinking like, man, I should have, I should have lived in Sugarland when I was playing for the Astros, but, um, I kind of stumbled upon it a couple of years after, you know, like really, really excited to be there. Um, based on my experiences that I, that I, that I had in 2015 and 16. Yeah, man, that's funny how time works and now you'll be back here full time. And, uh, yeah, that, that Baker street and all those great places, bar Louie out there in town square next to the Marriott, they're still there too. So we'll, we'll have to reintroduce you to some of those. Um, yeah. Well, I want to give our fans maybe a chance to get to know you a little better too. So I wanted to ask you, I mean, kind of put on your best time machine effort here. When you were getting ready for a game, I know pitchers are, you know, very routine oriented. What's bumping in your headphones when you're getting ready for a start? Mickey Story, like Sands 2016, when you, when you, or 2012 rather, when you Ooh, were with the Astros. 2012. Um, definitely like, <laughs> this is funny. Cause I'm, I feel like I'm so old now compared to what I was probably listening to then. Definitely like some young Jeezy or like TI. Definitely some hip hop. That's for sure. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, Jay Z, just like, yeah, ton of stuff. <laughs> Maybe even some Texas rap too, like some Bun B and Pimp C, because I was playing for the Astros in 2012. So, <laughs> probably feeling some like you know, little flip maybe. Nice. <laughs> definitely some southern <laughs> southern hip hop <laughs> oh i love it man that's awesome yep young jeezy man taking me take me back there a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah he has some good cds well, good you're... cds how about that they still make oh, CDs. <laughs> no I, I don't i don't think so i think that's like in the vcr so. the relics yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well uh before you know you got you've been connected with the astros for a while before you you became a coach with them and uh you know at the 2012 season i wanted to you know go back there i mean you had a pretty scary moment where you got hit in the face with a line drive and you, know, you only missed a few games, which is pretty incredible. But how frightening of an experience was that? Because I mean, that's something you see, and you know, it just makes you cringe. And it, thankfully, so you only missed a few starts. But were there like nerves when you got back on the mound or something like that? Yeah, and, and honestly, like in the moment, I've obviously seen the video like a billion times since, and it kind of, I'm kind of more known for that one moment than anything else I've ever done in in baseball, which is kind of sad. But like in the moment, it didn't, it didn't do much to me but i tell you what when i got back on the mound i was a little gun shy and i didn't think i would be Mm -hmm. because i I, i'm kind of a little bit tough like like kind of shook it off like my mouth was sore for a couple days but i didn't i didn't go on the dl or anything um and i remember like coming in the next day and and giving the manager the talk like oh yeah i can go today but thinking like yeah my mouth is Mm -hmm. killing me um but I, I'll never forget, I ended up throwing against pitching against the Pirates next. I, I'm pretty sure it was the Pirates after that. Maybe, I think it was a, maybe it was the Phillies. Either way, I remember throwing my first fastball down and away and being like, ooh, that was the pitch that got me smashed mm-hmm. in the face. Like, and kind of being like, all right, I'm going to pitch inside today. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, just because I had, I had felt that, like, a little bit of, you know, fastball extension to the down and away, and, and then the ball was in my face. So, like, it, it had like a little bit of a weird vibe when I tried to redo it, you know, the first sure. couple of times after, but yeah, scary moment. But honestly, like I'm super lucky that nothing really serious came out of that. 
Mickey, they say as an athlete, you die twice. Once when you retire, <laughs> and then finally when you kick the bucket. What was the biggest transition going from player to coach? Uh, the biggest transition, ooh, to cut, you know, the transition was made while I was playing. Honestly, I was, you know, after a couple years of injuries and then playing indie ball, kind of hanging on by a thread and, and wanting it to happen again. But my, my end all be all was getting back to the big leagues. And when I kind of felt like it was like kind of dwindling, I started to kind of check out and, and I always had a passion for, for player development, always wanted to be a coach, always wanted to stay in the game when I was done. So that, that last year I was playing indie ball, I was already kind of like hammering out, you know, conversations with teams and, and potential jobs and stuff. But the transition um, from player to coach was kind of just being completely reversing that role of like not being a player and being a staff member and, and, and kind of getting, a, you know, acclimated to, you know, how we view players, you know, how we – how we try to develop them, how the process goes, um, kind of, you know, staff meetings, kind of just like the the stuff that you never really envision as a player. You know, this, when you're a player, your staff, you see them on the field. You know what I mean? They're in uniform. They're in ground balls, throwing BP and kind of coaching, you know, coaching you up, which isn't all that different than playing. It, it's the behind the scenes work. It's the computer work. It's the preparation uh, it's the details. It's the organization. It's it's so many things that you you just didn't really think of it when you played, and you didn't appreciate it for the guys who did it for you either until you get in that sh in those shoes and you're like, oh wow, like if I want to be good at this, there's a, there's a ton of things that goes into it, and and kind of just that first year, I was I was on a great staff with Omar Lopez, who's now the first base coach in the big leagues, um, and kind of taught me so much about you know preparation, organization, details, you know all those things. Um, so, you know, that was definitely the biggest, you know, adjustment for me is, is seeing that there's more to coaching than being out on the field hitting fungos. Well, yeah, I mean, you've really, you know, dove, you know, head first into the coaching sphere. I mean, you've had a couple of great seasons as a manager. I mean, the best record in AAA back in 19, but I've also, I mean, you've done some pretty good work as a travel ball coach for your son back in Florida. I mean, <laughs> as, yeah, as, you know, yeah. I, I know your job will take you on the road a lot. I mean, how valuable is it to have that family time with your son? And I, I saw oh. you with the other two kids and being, being for them when they play sports. Yeah. So, yeah, my family's diehard sports. My wife played soccer at FAU. Uh, my oldest daughter plays soccer at, at a very competitive level. Um, and my son, he, he eats, sleeps and breathes baseball <laughs> at eight years old. I, people think it's crazy, you know, but I'm like, Hey man, if the kid loves it and I love it, like we're dangerous, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it, it's, it's like me and my dad's relationship, except my dad didn't play in the big leagues and coach in professional baseball. So like my son being able to go to the ballpark and spending time with, you know, these guys that he's, he's been with for over the years and build relationships with 2019 around rock. He spent, you know, so much time with us in the summer and, that was he was six years old that year, and he turned seven. And when I got home from that season, it was like a complete like, the, okay, I'm all baseball, uh -huh. you know, for him. And I was like, oh wow, this happened fast. Like before that, it was t-ball and it was fun, and then it was like, no, I like <laughs> eye black, you yeah. know, like I need bubble gum, I need sunglasses on my hat, you know, like kind of like picked up all the the pros things. Um, but it's fun, man. I I really enjoy the kids. Um, being able to give back to, to kids and enjoy the game and, you know, everything I've learned, like I spend as much time as I can out there and, and share experiences and, and less le life lessons, and you know, any kind of wisdom I can at that, at that age, you know, when, when you get kids who, who are having fun and, and they're, they're, you know, talented and doing well, like it, it's, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, my son, he, pl he plays a ton, like, you know, in South Florida, that's what they do. You yeah. Know? So it's, <laughs> even at that age, but it's, we, we really enjoy it. And he loves it. Yeah. You get to play year round. And I mean, how nice is that for the parents? It's like, yeah, the same guy that's coaching Jordan Alvarez and uh, yeah. all these guys packing around. We're like, Oh yeah. He's also coaching our son. So I'm sure they, they appreciate that too. Uh, yeah. I think it, gi it gives me a little <laughs> bit of recruiting leverage for there the travel go. team. <laughs> I love it, man. There you go. You got the FAU hat on already there too. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah. well, well, Hey man, before we let you go here, I just wanted to know, I mean, I, I, it's been a while since I guess you've really got to manage a game in front of fans. What's that going to be like for you? I know we open on May 6th in Albuquerque, but 
that first game on May 20th out here at Constellation Field. I mean, what are the emotions going to be like for you? Oh, it's going to be great. I can't wait. Honestly, being in spring training and having some fans was like the biggest breath of fresh air. Like after, you know, being at the alternate site, alternate site last year and the restart and doing all those things where it was just completely closed door workouts, like nobody around, nobody doing nothing. You know, you could hear a pin drop to being, to being in the building with, with fans. Oh, wow. It's going to be special to have those lights kick on for a night game and not a day workout or a day spring training game. Like, it's going to be exciting. It's it's one of those things like, you know, you, you, you never really know how much you appreciate it till it's gone. And, and we experienced the heck out of that last year, you know. Um, so it'll be special. I can't wait. No, oh, yeah, we can't wait here either. Well, that is Skeeter's manager, Mickey Story. Thank you so much for joining us, Mickey. Thank you, guys. All right, we'll be right back here on Down in Sugarland. Looking to relocate? Then contact Nick DeRose for any of your real estate needs in the Dallas Metroplex area. For more information, give them a call at 469-283-8360. DeRose Dallas Realty, cowboy by nature, agent by trade. All right, that was a great discussion with the new Skeeters manager, Mickey Story. We're excited to you know get to meet him and, and talk with him. He seems like a very interesting guy, and we're looking forward to getting to know him better. And speaking of getting to know him, Brandon, I thought it was pretty cool. You know, He, he opened up about his uh, his sneaker collection. I like that, that uh, very personalized little account of when he started collecting shoes and where, where he's at with it now. Yeah, such a fun personality, man. And that shoe collection actually is going to go a long way with the younger players. That's that's so big in the generation for younger kids right now to be a sneakerhead. And he seems legit. Didn't he say he's something over like 200 pairs? It's unbelievable. That's great. <laughs> I want to see what he and his wife think is adequate closet space. Well, yeah, like I, who has the bigger closet space for shoes? I'm curious. That's what I'm saying. He better hope that she doesn't have like a shoe fetish as well. Cause otherwise I'm pretty sure her kids are going to be like, Hey, we're going to just take a little space. <laughs> right. I know. And uh, he, uh, I'm interested to see, you know, one of the things I, we didn't get to ask him, but you know, we'll get to talk to him as the weeks go on is, you know, how do you manage that dynamic of, you know, you're a manager, you want to get wins, but you're also your first and foremost goal is player development. And I mean, he's a fast riser in this Astro system. He went from quad city or he went from Bowie's Creek actually as a coach, which was, they were the high A affiliate. Then he went to class a, Won a Midwest League title, goes to the Pacific Coast League, wins a Pacific Coast League title. So they think very highly of him. I think he's found a pretty good way to kind of find that high wire act of, hey, I want to win, but we want to develop. Well, and on top of that, he's going to understand players' mindset because he was one. So he'll speak player and also coach. So he's going to know how to draw that line, and it shows in his results. He'll be able to kind of break it down to a pitcher and just say, make these kind of adjustments in a game, and he'll see some results. But then he also has – the strategic mind to know what situations to bring a guy in. And he's somebody that's what's going to get the players up in the system, not only showing promise, but winning games never hurts. And he's a proven winner. Yeah, no doubt about it. And he also is a guy that he's played a lot of minor league games. He's played in Venezuela. He's played in the Dominican. He's played independent ball. So, you know, you talk about guys like Alex Degotti, uh, Ralph Garza, who haven't yet got their first crack at the big leagues. And, you know, that can be, you know, sometimes – Pretty tough to deal with, but he's a guy he can say, "Hey, man, I stuck with it." Like you, the track record's there. He's a really a, a good figurehead to have up there in the organization. And uh, like I said, I mean, he's only thirty five years old, super young. I mean, I'm sure he's very relatable to these guys, and it seems like an easy guy to have a conversation with. I also love his honesty. When we when you asked him about when he came back from the injury after getting hit in the face, and was there kind of a mental sure. kind of gap? Typically, the bravado answer is no. Yeah. I just stepped up on there after the first fastball. I was good, but. No, he was complete opposite. He talked about how he was nervous, how he kind of was a little bit worried. And I think that's going to carry weight, knowing that he's going to be up front with you. I think the players will really respond to that. Yeah, that yeah, that's a great point. Because I, I, myself, when I was, you know, writing that question out, I'm like, do I ask this? Is it weird? I mean, I, I don't want to, like, bring up a, a tough memory for him. And, man, he was an open book about it. And like you said, I was really, if, if any answer, I was expecting, yeah, didn't think about it much. But, he, I mean, like any human being, you get hit in the face with a screaming line drive, you're going to flinch or two, like I said, the next outside pitch you threw, which was the same one that got taken up the middle, you know, flinched a little bit. And like any human being, that's that's a very natural reaction. Um, so it was fun to get to know him. Um, and I, like I said, we'll have him on again at some point. And I, I think he's a guy that we'll learn a lot from, Brandon, and kind of as we get to talk to him more. And I honestly want to start seeing these shoes as well. I think that would be <laughs> something fun to start putting up on the social and letting the fans start to interact too that are sneaker heads out there and, make like a challenge or something that we can do. Yeah. And uh, also, I mean, hey, not a bad, 
way to grow up. You know, grow up in South Florida, then you just stay right there at Boca Raton at FAU. Uh, you know, he's grew, growing up in a nice little area, and um, we're pumped to have him here. Well, when we come back, we're going to finish episode number five off with a little happy hour. You're listening to Down in Sugarland. All right, fellows, it is time to end the episode on a happy note with happy hour. And the the concept is quite simple. We just talk about stuff that makes us happy. Bad lead off. Brandon, what's making you happy? Finding money in random locations around your house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whether most commonly it's found in the jean pocket, right? Doing laundry, pull out a little five ski or something like that. <laughs> and it's just an instant <laughs> happiness. This never happens to me. I feel like every time... I pull out something. It's like a bill that I owe, like instead of actual <laughs> money. But the other day, I was cleaning out my car, and I found the holy grail, a $20 bill oh, wow. underneath oh. my seat. And then it made me wonder, since this never happens to me, is this mine? And if it's not mine, the person has no idea. So I think this is the universe telling me, spend me. It's Mr. <laughs> Jefferson, I mean, I think that, you know, people are going to find that less and less. I feel like cash is just a novelty in itself now. So we're... We're kind of seeing like the endangered species of random loose leaf cash. I agree. It's one of those things where I can't wait to take it. I, now, what do I spend the money on? Do I take it and like buy myself a meal? Charity. That's the <laughs> easy answer that everybody's going to give. Yeah. You donate it to the needy of $20. You turn it into the police, Brandon. I don't know what you're talking about. I feel like I should do some. We could do something show related with it. Oh. Yeah, I like that. Maybe like a little like pizza party. <laughs> Between the three of us, we've already done that plenty. Of Everybody time. gets one slice. <laughs> I think we could turn that over to the show. What should we start to do with the twenty dollars? Okay, All right, okay. we'll, we'll put it on a poll somewhere. We'll figure that out. <laughs> but that's what makes me happy: finding the money in random spots. It needs to happen to more people more often. I love it. Yeah, I wish. I think that's a great uh, thing to strive for. Troy, what about you? What's making you happy over there? You know, I was thinking about the other day. I love walking around in my neighborhood, and then you just get a whiff of someone lighting up a grill whether that be charcoal barbecue you know they're gonna be cooking something good um and then i just get hit with like a whiff of you know nostalgia of you know being a kid hanging out by the pool with friends and family waiting for that hot dog or burger to come off the grill it's you know you have the baseball game on it's one of my favorite feelings especially during the summer yeah is that a good smell is that nice? Is that yeah. nice to do? Yeah, I'm sorry to bring that up, Brandon. If 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 y'all don't know, I guess Brandon can't smell. Yeah, people call it nose blind. The fact that I can't smell at all. It's been uh, ever since I was a little kid. I have a horrific deviated septum. It can be fixed. I know. I've been told that a million times. But I'm worried about if I get this sense of smell, it will change me. I, well, if you smell the smell of barbecue, it will change you. It's like a religious experience almost. I, I'm with you, Troy. Uh, you know. I, I didn't grow up in Texas, but even where I did grow up in California, like you get a burger on the grill. I mean, man, you know, you know, it's going down like and it's always like on the weekend, too. So, you know, it's like everyone's in a good mood. And I mean, I had a charcoal grill going up. So, I mean, th- those things put off mm-hmm. a pretty distinctive uh, smell. Well, we're going to put you on the spot here, Troy. Top three meats you throw on the grill right now. Don't even think about it. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Ribeye, New York strip. I mean, those are two steaks. Any steak. Uh... Obviously, you got to go with burger, 80-20, um, Angus beef, or ground chuck. That's that's my go-to. Wow. That was, yeah, you, I didn't really push you on the spot there. You kind of just <laughs> you kind of just knocked that out of the park. I, I almost enjoy grilling more than I do eating the food. It's like the act of doing it, standing by a fire, drinking an ice-cold beer on a nice summer evening. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's the best. That's it's hard to go to a barbecue, like, in a bad mood. You know, yeah. No one really goes upset, and especially when they get there, grow more upset. Yeah, uh, I like to sometimes just be like the total like jerk guy too. It's like I know what I'm doing. Like I walk up to the guy, I'm like, yeah, that burger is a flip. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like that's like the one thing I feel like you, you don't ask like a woman their age. Like you don't ask a guy to flip his burger. Like I feel like there's a few like unwritten like rules like that. Now, nope. when you're rocking the grill, do you get to wear an apron or no apron? That's a good question. I don't do a lot of grilling, so I, I, I defer to I, Troy I, on this. I go no apron. I don't, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be like, this is, <laughs> what does it say, like some grill chef or something on kiss your the, apron. Kiss the cook. Yeah, kiss the cook. <laughs> no, I'm not about that. I have to go apron if I'm going to grill, just because like wiping your hands, you know, that's, that's. I mean, I'm a towel, right? Simple solution. Yeah. 
But now, man, when you're grilling, it's better just to wipe it all over your body like war paint. Right. I mean, I'm I'm already a big sweater just without anything like hot like that <laughs> to grill. So I think apron would be the good. I'm apron with like a towel over my shoulder guy for sure. I feel like the apron would be acting as a towel for. Oh you, no, right? I need two of them. It's gonna be. <laughs> this is a big sweaty mess there over the grill. I don't want. I don't want to be sweating people's food. <laughs> Ryan, yeah. what makes you happy? Oh man, well I had this actually happen to me. As soon as we're talking about things that were recent, um, nothing like. You know, you pull up to your local Taco Bell and you're you're hoping, you know, man, I'm hungry. I want my Chalupa. I want my Crunchwrap Supreme. Nothing better when you go up there and you are first in line. No one in front of you. You're Dale Earnhardt <laughs> speeding up there to that, that lighted window and you are the king in the castle. I'm with you on the fact that you honestly feel like you're royalty for a day. That like you got a fast pass to like the, yes. to ordering and you're just ahead of everybody. My favorite is when you pull up to order and then suddenly a massive line gets behind oh, you. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I like to think people followed me. They're all like, "Oh, Brandon's going to go eat McDonald's. <laughs> we should go eat McDonald's too." It just feels like they're waiting for me. Like <laughs> I, when I pull up, I'm like, "Oh man, hey guys, like good to see you." Yeah, it's like, "Oh, Ryan." Like, "Yep, I'm back again for like the fifth time in 5 days." <laughs> yep, that's me. Like Is that always Taco Bell? Yeah, I mean, other places, I don't I'm a, I'm okay. Like I like going to drive these honestly because I'm a big like we're we're making a podcast, like listen to podcasts. I don't I'm not like big on like, oh man, if there's a big line, I can't go. Like sometimes in and out, I know that one can be like a little bit daunting, but like a couple cars, no biggie, but it's just like, man, you see it there. You're like, man, I picked a good time to get my Taco Bell on. Like, yo quiero, like I'm ready for it. <laughs> so when I was visiting in China, when I was living in uh, overseas, they had a hard time when they opened up the first drive through The problem was it was a massive line. The people were going through the drive through collecting their food, then parking their cars and going inside and eating. And it was one after another. Oh, no. So then they started have to release like commercials, like explaining how to go through a drive through. It was hilarious just to watch. Like it was just the funniest concept because eating in your car was just a weird thought. Yeah. And I, and I mean, is Taco Bell like is probably like one of those places where that takes two hands. It, it, well, yeah. I mean that, trust me, I've learned from experience. It's <laughs> not a, that's a food where you're, you're going to lose a few shirts every time you leave in your car. <laughs> Um, but also like it gets busy at random hours. Like it could be no cars at like 2 a.m. But 2.15, there's like seven cars waiting, waiting to get food. Well, duh. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> like I never know, man. It's, you're really rolling the dice. So when you don't see anybody there, it's just uh, it's just a beautiful experience. And uh, one that I'm very happy about. Well, that's going to do it here for episode number five. Thank you so much for listening. Next week, we have on the Astros legend Shane Reynolds. Till next time, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. You've been listening to Down in Sugarland.